Baseball is right around the corner. Pitchers and catchers report in a couple of weeks. And today we're going to talk about the biggest storylines in spring. As we head into camp and whatnot, what are the biggest storylines left surrounding this team all today on Locked on Tigers? You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I am, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Wednesday, January 25th, 2023. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment matter more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Okay, we are back. What's up, everybody? Midweek check-in. How's everybody doing? I hope you all are having a fantastic week. So today, I know that we're still a few weeks out, even from pitchers and catchers reporting, nonetheless, from spring training starting. Uh, But I think that there are very clear, like, biggest moves, not moves, that's not the right word at all, biggest storylines surrounding this team as we head in to spring ball. And I just want to highlight those and give an idea to everybody else of where my head is at with this team as we get closer and closer to people starting to report down in Lakeland, Florida. So, uh, yeah, that, that's really all today's, today's show is going to be. Just kind of going over, you know, what jobs are still relatively up in the air, who has the most to gain, who has the most to lose in the spring. Just in general, spring training, uh, what what are the biggest storylines surrounding the team? So let's get right into it here. I think I want to start with the catcher room, uh, as I usually do if you're a longtime listener. I love me some catchers. I love my catchers. Uh, and, and I think that this is one of the, I don't want to say underrated storylines, but I think it's one that not enough people are maybe, maybe giving like – People aren't giving it enough credit as a legitimate storyline for this spring. Uh, I I think everybody is pretty much in the same boat that like Eric Haas is going to be on this team, not only, but probably the 1A catcher, right? I don't think there's too much disparity in that these days, which is great. That's fine. We know who our man is going into spring training. That's awesome. Uh, and, And presumably going into opening day. That's all great. I think... The catching situation after Eric Haas is going to be a lot more fluid, maybe than than people give it credit for. I, I'm not saying that Jake Rogers can't just take the one B catcher job by the horns and just run with it, and, and he can just play the entire season as one B if he stays healthy. Like that's totally on the table, a hundred percent. I'm just saying that that's not predetermined. That's all. I think that Donnie Sands, someone that I've talked about a lot since getting acquired, is one of the more overlooked pieces in that Soto trade. I think he's going to get a legitimate look and will get a chance to leave an imprint, an impression rather, uh, on these this coaching staff in spring training. And then even besides those three, they have brought in a plethora of catchers this offseason and a lot of dudes who have the – the ability to make some noise in spring. I'm not saying some of the other guys necessarily can just like win the catching job out of camp. Again, like I think it's, it's close to like presumably Eric Haas's right. But at the same time, I I think, you know, AJ has talked and we'll actually talk about this later in the show. AJ has talked about the versatility of Eric Haas and how he wouldn't mind him playing in the corner outfield more. He wanted to do that a lot more last year, but injuries wouldn't allow it. So, I think that there's a lot of room for not improvement, but I think that there's a lot of room for other catchers in this organization to to really have a bigger role than maybe people realize. So the catcher situation is definitely one. And again, I I will reiterate again, just so that my point is abundantly clear. uh, It's certainly not impossible for Jake Rogers to, to just take it and run. And that'd be awesome. I would love to just have a solidified 1A, 1B going into opening day. No hesitations about anything. That'd be great. 
Um, but I, I just, I don't think we're just determining that now at the end of January, we're like, Oh yeah, like that, that's just how it's going to be. And spring doesn't matter at all. And, and the, those are the, the starters, you know, like there are some positions like center field. It doesn't really matter how like poor Riley green plays necessarily in the spring. I mean, if he's batting, I don't know if he has like a 300 OPS, maybe there's some conversations, but, um, there, there are certain positions that are way more predetermined than others, like shortstop. Javi, I think, could legitimately go 0 for 40 in the spring, and like he's going to be the opening day shortstop. You know what I mean? And I don't think that Rodgers as the 1B catcher is nearly as predetermined as, as people think. That's all. So I, that's something that I have my eye on for sure. Probably the biggest, uh, not in the sense of magnitude, but just in the the, the most universally aware, right? The, the entire fan base is very aware that the bullpen situation – is one of the biggest storylines heading into spring. And that's something that I, I know that everybody already has their eye on and will continue to have their eye on. Uh, I, I think you have five near locks, right? I think you have Lang, Foley, Alexander, Cisnero, and Will Vest. And, and those are clo all close to locks, right? There, there's something can happen always with, with people that, I mean, most of these dudes only have, outside of Cisnero, only have like a year or two of MLB experience. I guess Alexander has, has probably about three now, but um, regardless, like th this, is, or is this four already for him? Golly, time flies. Uh, so uh, there are certainly some that, that maybe feel more comfortable than others in there, but I think all of those you can pretty comfortably say are going to be in the bullpen on opening day. And, and that leaves you three to even four spots, depending on who you want, what position you want your 26 man on the roster to be right and we have brought in so many players on minor league contracts with invites to spring training. Several of those, a majority of those players actually, are bullpen pieces. So you're going to see a really healthy bullpen competition in the spring, which I am a huge fan of. Uh, I love when spring training has, has meaning, right? I think, and there's a difference between that and like completely overreacting to spring, which everyone does, myself included. And I can't wait to do that with you. I, I truly can't. Uh, but I, I think that this is a situation in which for, for a solid, again, like three to four spots in this bullpen. And again, like we have Ingler, we have a rule five pick. Like you can kind of, I don't want to say assume, but uh, you can somewhat presume like he's going to have a good shot to make the team. Uh, and then we'll get to the, the four starters that we always kind of group together later the, you know, one of at least one of those guys is going to be in the bullpen, possibly more. So th there's definitely some guys that you can go, Oh, more likely than others. But uh, that doesn't mean that it's not there for the taking. I, I think there's legitimate openings at the back end of this bullpen. Mm. I shouldn't say back end because that's not what I mean, but uh, in the back part of this bullpen in the back half of the pen. So something as well that, that will be very noteworthy heading into spring. Uh, let's keep, let's just go around the diamond. Let's, let's keep going into it. I, I still got a few more storylines that I want to talk about. I'm very, very excited for spring. That's why we're talking about this at the end of June. But I also think that you can, the reason that we're talking about it now is because you can somewhat pencil in, most of these guys, especially for spring training rosters, which are which are much bigger than even the forty man, like you can, cut, we we know who's going to be there in, in the spring. We're not kind of looming around for trades. There still might be another trade, but we're not going to like sit around and wait for one. There's not a ton of moves that I think are left. I think this is close to the final product, um, even if you know you do think there might be one more trade or whatnot. So uh, now that we kind of have the, the best idea we've had all offseason of what, what the roster is going to look like heading into spring, I just want to have the conversation now and get out in front of it. And then obviously when spring starts, those storylines will be evolving. So we'll talk about those uh, midweek. And yeah, in the middle of February, we'll go back to uh, to five episodes a week as well. Super pumped. Can't wait for baseball to be back. Let's keep getting into it. Uh, but first, I got to tell you all about our new friends over at FanDuel. Sportsbook. We are really excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because they're the number one sportsbook in America. It's FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. New customers, you can join today and get started with $150 in free bets. Guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. 
You place a $5 bet, your first time at FanDuel, you get $150 in free bets. Sounds like a good deal to me. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel has all your favorite bets from the money line to the point spreads, player props, etc. Plus, you can even combine your bets for a chance on a bigger payout with a same game parlay. It's awesome. FanDuel really is the best in the business. It's all on a safe app that's secure and easy to use. So, football fans, baseball fans, sports fans, don't miss out. Place your first $5 bet. Get $150 in free bets, win or lose, at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the NFL. Pretty nice banner. Welcome back, everybody. Segment two here, Lockdown Tigers. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. Lock, check out the Lockdown MLB Prospects podcast. Host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia. He's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, just like us. Okay, let's get back into it here. So we talked about the bullpen. We talked about the catcher situation. I think the other... Big one. If it's if you don't think that if you were to rank them, and you don't think that the bullpen is number one, I think a lot of people's number one is going to be third base, right? And again, that's not like a secret. That's not something that I'm telling you something you don't already know. Everyone's very aware that the third base situation this year is going to be fluid, to say the least. Uh, I mean, we have so many options here: Nick Maton, Andre Lipsius, Ryan Kreidler, Matt Veerling plays has played third at the major league level uh Tyler Nevin I mean it, there's even like conversations about Jonathan Scope like the, I get a comment probably once a month about like Torkelson still playing third like Zach Short in, in that conversation oh Zach Short by the way uh, I got a question on Twitter about Zach Short still being on the roster and like how he made it through the off season. We kind of talked about it a little bit on the zips episode. Um, so, so if you missed that one, you can go back and, and see the, the full thing, you know, Zach short zips has leading the team in walks. If he played a full season, which obviously isn't going to happen because he's not going to play a full season, but uh, regardless that like he just fits the profile. Like he's a solid enough defender. He's going to have a terrible batting average. You're absolutely right. Uh, but he's a solid enough defender at multiple positions, and he walks a boatload and has at every level, and that just fits. Uh, I don't think Zach Short's going to play like a prolific part in the team this year. I, I think he will he barely had any at-bats at the major league level last year. I would imagine that he would be similar to that this year. I don't think it's going to be like a, a, a huge you know, Zach Short resurgence as far as playing time goes, but um, I, I do think that it is just important to note that that's why he's still on the 40 man because he fits the profile that Scott Harris wants, whether you like it or not. Uh, that one was from a Ron Garrett on Twitter, by the way. So shout out to Ron. He's uh, yeah. Super interactive. I appreciate him. Okay. So third base. Oh, you have all of those names. Zach short, probably not like legitimately in that mix about like, you know, going to be the opening day starter at third or anything, but another dude that might play third at some point this year. And just laying it out like that, uh, Justin Henry Malloy as well. I don't know how I forgot his name. Like that's that's what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, eight like eight to ten. Even like if you want to like throw torque and just get like throw in everybody who could possibly play an inning at third this year. Like you're pushing double digits, you know. So I, I do think that that's going to be again for a lot of people probably the number one storyline heading into spring ball is just going to be how who's going to kind of take the bull by the horns and, and really ride into opening day as the, the starting third baseman. I st think it's still very much up for grabs. I, I, I don't think I'd, if I had to make a guess on January 25th, I, I guess I would say Maton, but like that's, I, I think spring is going to determine a lot. I wouldn't rule out Henry Malloy entirely. I, I think he's he'll probably start in the minors, but I wouldn't rule that out entirely. Ryan Kreidler is probably the second most like, likely option if, if Maton is your number one. Uh, I know that he's number one on a lot of people's list too, though, Kreidler. Um, uh, we have the scope conversation all the time. I think he'll probably stay at second. Um, I, Andre Lipsius, I don't know if he explodes in the spring. Could he play his way onto a team? Probably not, but like maybe, I don't know. I think spring will determine a lot and give us a much clearer picture 
about third base going forward than we see right now when we have like legitimately five to eight names that you could all kind of throw in the mix of like people who might play third a legitimate amount this year. So that's definitely another big one. Uh, the, the I kind of alluded to it earlier, but the four starting pitchers that we group together all the time, uh, Wentz, Brisky, Fiedo, and Hill. I think that that that's another pretty big storyline, whether it's which one of them ends up in the bullpen, whether it's which one of them goes down and is part of the Toledo rotation, whether it's any of them like somehow carving out a role as either a swing man or even like, hey, we're going to go to a six man rotation this year. Like th there are a, a lot of possibilities that stem from the, pr the spring production of those four men. And so that is definitely one of the bigger ones as well uh, with, with like bar none. Absolutely. Next up, where do we want to go next? I think, well, I guess kind of sticking on topic of uh, pitching, I, I kind of mentioned him earlier, but we didn't really go too much in depth. Jason Foley, I think is one of the more overlooked storylines heading into spring ball. Uh, I love Jason Foley. This is someone who on this show, if you've been listening for a long time, I appreciate you. Uh, but that is somebody who very early on, we kind of targeted as like, Hey, this kid's like pretty nice, right? Like this dude's nice. And that sinker is really, really effective. And he carved out uh, a name for himself last season. So uh, I think that Foley, uh, not to say that if he has like a dominant spring, that he's just going to be the closer on opening day necessarily. But uh, I think he could play his way in like very quickly whether it's spring ball or just like the first couple of weeks of the regular season, I think he could play his way into being a more high leverage reliever very quickly, especially with the pitch to contact and nature of a sinker ball pitcher, right? Having that out of your bullpen. Oh, you have men on base, etc. You need a ground ball. You want to try and turn a double play. Let, let's go to Foley out of the pen. Like I, I really do. I think that he could, if he has a really good spring or, or like I said, early part of the season, I think he could play his way into to being one of the, like surprisingly, one of the more high leverage relievers on the team. So he's another guy I have kind of circled heading into spring ball. Um, let's see. I, I also have written down just the five newest additions. That's not true anymore. I can't say that. I was going to say the five newest additions to the 40 man roster, but that hasn't been true in a couple of months. Uh, the five prospects that were added, at the Rule 5 protection deadline. So, Winseal Perez, Parker Meadows, Andre Lipsius, Brendan White, and Reese Olsen. I think that those five uh, are definitely players that I have my eyes on in the spring, kind of getting our, our first presumably legitimate look at them against Major League Talent in spring ball. And, you know, for Perez and Meadows, I'm assuming, in Lipsius, really, for, for the three bats, I'm assuming that they're going to start off in Toledo. Uh, and that's fine. That That's where they're at developmentally. I Good. Like, great. We'll probably see at least one of them, if not all of them, at some point in the regular season, especially with injuries and whatnot. Um, so looking forward to it. It's where they're at in development. That's fine. The two pitchers really just – white to be honest like like Reese Olsen for sure could like wow and and kind of have a conversation about should he be in the bullpen to start off the year or whatnot but I think they want to give Reese Olsen a legitimate opportunity to be a starting pitcher and I don't think that he will there's any amount that he can do in spring training to have him win that at the major league level out of camp um, so I think Brennan White is, is the biggest storyline of those five because I think that he's the guy that could legitimately make this team out of spring training. I think there's a a definitely a shot for White to be in the bullpen on opening day. The likelihood of it, I mean, we can argue about that till we're blue in the face. I'm not saying that it's that it's a guarantee or anything, but just with again how many openings there are in the bullpen, what style of pitcher he is, I, I think that that's again like one of the more overlooked things is just how he produces in the spring could have massive ramifications for like the entire structure of the bullpen heading into opening day. And so that, that I would say he more so than the other five, but really all five of them, I definitely have my eye on as we head into spring training, uh, pitchers and catchers, man, just a couple of weeks, just a couple of weeks. A few, what are we two weeks away? Three weeks away. I cannot wait. 
Okay, let's get into uh, the last few storylines I have here. We'll wrap it up uh, right after this. All right, everybody, welcome back. Third and final segment here at Locked On Tigers. Uh, so let's just get right back into it. No transition or anything. Just straight back to the point, baby. Uh, Torkelson and Green, uh, I think, are fairly obvious ones. Um, not that Torkelson probably more so than Green, just because of all the pressure that Torque had on him last year. And and while Riley Green was not setting the world on fire, uh, I think people are still a lot more optimistic about Green at, at the present moment. And I also think that, I mean, even in the shorter sample size, Green was just like better than Torque. And, and again, Green's numbers weren't even like that fantastic. But at times last year, for a majority of last year, to be honest, Torque, like unfortunately, really struggled. And I think people are going to want to see adjustments immediately just because like, A, that's the society and the world we live in. But also, I mean, just to have a... a rejuvenation of, of some faith uh, about the future of the position. And I'm not saying if he struggles in spring that you should just like, Oh, like I'm totally out on him. He's a complete boss. And I know some people like already think that way and that's fine, whatever. But I, I think that a lot of people are going to be a lot more optimistic about, mm, I don't want to put like all the pressure in the world on him or say that like if he does well, people are just going to think that the Tigers are going to be good because that's ridiculous as well. But I think people will will be a lot more optimistic about what he can accomplish this season if he just gets off to a hot start in spring ball, which isn't exactly fair to him. I'm not saying that's a fair thing to put on to someone, uh, but that's just kind of the state of the fan base, I feel like. like People are just waiting to see anything at, in the batter's box from Torque, and uh, if that – comes in spring that I think uh, people will, will like I said, kind of rejuvenate their their hope and, and expectations within him for the season. Uh, but Green is is in that conversation just to a much lesser extent as well. I think they're, all eyes will be on the two of them, much like they were last year. People have big hopes, big expectations, and uh, yeah, spring ball is going to be no different. So fairly obvious one there, but definitely something to point out. So the last points I have kind of all intertwine with each other. My first one is going to be Akil Badu individually. I think that Badu is in a really unique situation where he, if he plays really well, could be not only the fourth outfielder, but honestly could be like the opening day left fielder. If he plays really well in the spring and if he struggles again, could find himself like not on the major league roster. Like as far as people that have the the most to gain and lose in spring ball, Badu's name is is, is up there. If he's not number one, he's definitely in the conversation. He, he's close to the top of that list. So that's definitely one of the bigger storylines. I think again, just thought of people that have the most to lose and gain. Badu certainly in that mix, and, and that also kind of ties in to. The, the last point I have, which is fourth outfielder in general. Uh, we're, we're very focused on third base because th there's no one on the roster right now that like on their baseball reference page says third baseman on it. Like, I, and I get that and that that's totally justified. And, and that's, that's probably the biggest story in the spring, but uh, fourth outfielder is, is like very much up for the taking, especially when you can like start thinking about how they could construct this roster right? So like you have green and you have meadows and you can somewhat assume Matt Veerling as well, right? The new addition from the Gregory Soto trade. I'd be pretty shocked if he wasn't on the team on opening day either. So you have those three that you're kind of chalking up as like, okay, prob like all, all, we're pretty confident that these three will be on the team on opening day. Veerling plays majority outfield, even though he has the ability to, to play in the infield at the major league level as well. Green is, is going to be the center fielder all year. And Meadows is probably strictly going to be right field or DH on some days. We'll get to DH in a second, too, because that kind of plays into this as well. Then you have Badu, who we just talked about. Then, as we alluded to earlier, you have Eric Haas, who AJ would really like to utilize the versatility of more this year, if possible. If the opportunity doesn't present itself. He's not going to force it, I don't think. But that's certainly an option. We've seen Haas play in the corner outfield before at the beginning of last season. Uh, then you have the other Meadows. You, you have Parker Meadows, who I don't think is going to make this team 
out of spring training, but I guess maybe second half of the season. We're talking about spring ball, so that doesn't really apply, but uh, someone that a lot of people like to throw in the mix there, and, and I think we're just going to have to take our time with that one. And then you have Kerry Carpenter, who, according to the Detroit Tigers, is still listed as a designated hitter, uh, at least on some pages, and then some it's outfield. So uh, I, he's certainly in that mix. Corner outfield will probably get some opportunities at DH probably a lot because I don't think Miguel Cabrera is going to play like too terribly much this season. I think it's, you know, once, maybe twice a series, but probably like once a series uh, for the most part. I, I think people will be surprised about uh, like how, how little, like they're not going to play Miggy like 150 games just because it's his last year. Like uh, he's got all the milestones, all the career accomplishments it's over. Like, I, I think they're, they're going to give him, you know, he'll get like Sunday home games so that people can buy their tickets and see him one last time or whatever. And, and he'll certainly get a proper send off, but uh, like he, he's not going to be playing too terribly much. So Carpenter could get a lot of looks at DH as well, but at what point are you putting Carpenter on the roster and he, you're no longer penciling him in as a fourth outfield option. And you're more penciling him in as just the other DH or the one a DH and Miggy's the one B right. So I, I think you have a lot of a flexibility, which is never a bad thing in a vacuum, but you have a lot of decisions to make about who's going to be like, do you just carry everybody? You have green meadows, veerling, Badu, carpenter. You're just going to roll in with five dudes that play the outfield. You have 26 men on a roster. Now I'm not saying that's, that's like ridiculous or some like blasphemy statement. You can absolutely do that. Um, it, it might cost you one of the bullpen spots, which I guess is a fair trade off. If you think it is like fine. Uh, but, uh, and then again, like Eric Haas, like how often is he there? How many catchers are you carrying? If you roll in with, with Haas Rogers and Sands on opening day, and that's how you utilize the 26 men on the roster. Then you can give Haas a little more opportunities in the outfield. You don't have to roster, I guess, Badu if he struggles in the spring. He might be the odd man out. But uh, just out of the names that I mentioned there. But, like, the, there, there is a, a lot of variance that could happen. You could see... Uh, again, anywhere from like three outfielders and Haas, but because we are carrying three catchers, is okay. it's okay to like five dudes who can play outfield even. I mean, like Maton has experience in the outfield. Like the, there's so much they can do with that four to the outfielder spot. And I'm just fascinated with, with who is going to be on the roster that can play corner outfield. Like how many of those dudes are we really going to carry? And I don't say that in negative connotation. I love versatility. I'm right with the coaching staff and with, with AJ Hinch on that. I'm, I'm all for the versatility and, and moving players around and uh, setting lineups based on like who, who the opposing pitcher is and whatnot. That's all great. And I can't wait to see all the different defensive structures and, and lineups and defensive lineups that we see this year. I can't wait for it. Um, but I, I like fourth outfielder is is really on like in the same light to me as third base is and and just like spring I think is going to tell a lot and I think there is a a million different avenues that that kind of go off of that that uh, you you can there's a lot of different possibilities with it and that's kind of exciting kind of exciting okay okay is that it I think that's it. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every day. For your next listen, check on the Locked On MLB Prospects podcast. Host Lindsey Crosby is a prospect encyclopedia, and he's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube, just like us, baby. Okay, I think that's all I got for y'all. I'm pumped. I know that this is a little early, right? Like <laughs> spring training doesn't start tomorrow. Pitchers and catchers don't even report for a couple of weeks, but uh, we don't have any moves to really go over. And, and I think that, like I said earlier, we, we have the clearest idea of what this roster is going to look like heading into the spring than, than we have all off season. So I just want to get out ahead of it and we can kind of talk about those storylines as people start showing up in Lakeland and start reporting for camp. So uh, around the corner, baby, right around the corner. Can't wait. Um, I think that's it. I appreciate y'all. Thank you for your constant support. As always, uh, you'll never know how much I appreciate it, for real. Very, very grateful. 
That's it, man. Peace and love. Going to Therapy's Dope. And I'll catch you all on Friday, baby. Go Tigers.